Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lisa Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning. Monday morning, December the 27th. I'm happy to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. I'm just having coffee waking up. I had a good weekend. I hope everybody else did too. And I had a very Merry Christmas. And I wish you all uh, the best. You know, I hope that you all had a, a nice time too. Um, I didn't do a, a couple of shows just because of, of Christmas. I was just away from the house and um, celebrating Christmas. But glad to be back and glad to be able to do the shows. This morning I want to look at an article called Effects of Abuse. It's from the same website we were looking at last week. It's from mentalhelp.net, www.mentalhelp. Let me make sure I'm getting you the right. Uh, yeah, www.mentalhelp, M-E-N-T-A-L-H-L-P.net. And the article is from Catherine Petricelli called Effects of Abuse. So I want to look at that. We finished up with that last article uh, Friday morning, and I just want to continue on. There's a few articles on here that are worth kind of looking at. That's what I think. Uh, there's some pretty good info on this website. I hope everybody go check it out. There's lots and lots of different kinds of, of information about, you know, the mental illness and, and topics and related topics and about abuse. And so there's quite a few articles actually about abuse on here. Um, so that's why I wanted to kind of take a look at some of it. And some of it is really quite interesting to look at. The the article we were looking at Friday I found was very interesting. Um, when children are beaten, you know, the aftermath. Uh, I just think it, it, it's kind of, you know, worth taking a look at. So we'll continue on with this. And so that's what we're going to do today. I'm not a counselor or therapist. I don't hold any certificates in those areas. You, you know, I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own shows. So you have to listen at your own description. I'm talking about abuse. Abuse is a very sensitive topic for most people. You know, I had to face this my whole life, so I, I'm not, you know, it doesn't bother me to actually look at it um, or talk about it, right? Um, some people may find it very uncomfortable, right? So you have to know where you're at, you know, and, and how and what's good for you to listen to, right? If, if a topic makes you feel uncomfortable or it's just like, wow, this is going to bother me or if you're a survivor of child abuse and you're just not very far in your healing journey, you know, you got to be very careful what you're listening to. Make sure it's not going to trigger you or cause you to be uncomfortable. So anybody who feels uncomfortable with the topic of abuse, really, it's up to you. you have to listen at your own discretion and you have to turn the show off if it bothers you. That is clearly your discretion. Young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have permission to listen to my shows because I believe in protecting children at all times, right? I'm fighting to save children's lives, right? That's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. So, you know, you just need to learn how to keep yourself safe online and know that you know, that when there's a chat room, you need to know how to keep yourself safe. And also that there's a lot of adult content on my shows. And I just think young people should be protected at all times. You should have someone listen to the show with you who's older, and an adult, who can help you make the decision whether you should be listening. So thanks, everybody. We'll get right into the topic here. And um, I have the link into the chat room. It's, called, it's www.mentalhelp.net. It gives a whole bunch of other stuff after it, so I'm just going to give you the name of the title. It's under Abuse. So if you go there and you search under Abuse, it's called Effects of Abuse by Catherine Patricelli. And she posted this December 15, 2005, so it's a few years old, but it doesn't matter because it's good info. Um, she says here, I'm just reading right from the page, and you can go there and check this out too. Just follow that link, and then... Um, you know, I'll probably I'm just going to add my own stuff in there as we go along, right? Uh, being abused, she says, does not necessarily cause psychological or medical illness to occur. However, being abused does make it more much more likely that one or more psychological or medical illnesses will occur. People commonly develop emotional or psychological problems secondary to their abuse, including anxiety disorders and various forms of depression. We develop substance abuse disorders. And if abuse has been very severe, the victim can be traumatized and may develop a post-traumatic stress injury, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or acute stress disorder. She also says here, if, if abuse has occurred from a very early age and has been substantial, a personality disorder can result or can occur, such as borderline, narcissistic, or histrionic personality disorders, or in some cases, severe dissociative disorder, such as dissociative identity disorder, DID, right? Uh, commonly known as multiple personality disorder. Um, she says here, sexual disorders may be present. So she says sex may be experienced as particularly undesirable or physically or emotionally painful. Alternatively, um, sexual promiscuity may be observed with the increased risk of sexually transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancy that such behavior carries. 
Uh, severe abuse can lead the victim to contemplate suicide or carry out suicidal impulses. Abuse can result in poor self-esteem, which can lead to a lack of close and trusting relationships or to body image issues, particularly for sexual abuse victims, which in turn can result in eating disorders, uh, which can be seen as victims' attempts at self-control in one small part of life when they otherwise feel completely out of control and vulnerable. So so really, I mean, it's... it's uh, pretty harsh you know what happens to people who have been abused and i know so many people i talk about this a lot on my shows um who have been abused and i, I like today i know lots and lots of survivors just because of what i'm doing but i and i've met so many awesome people you know who who are survivors of child abuse and um even you know domestic violence and whatnot and what it's just so absolutely so horrific what what abuse does to people that's why i'm, I'm speaking out you know if it was no big deal then I would have just not thought, you know, well, no big deal. Who needs to bother even speaking out about this? That's why people are screaming, you know. That's why people are upset. That's why uh, there's always been a handful of people in the world, in society, you know, who are willing to stand up and say this is incredibly wrong because it is. And the, the damage that's done is so horrible. <laughs> and not everybody experiences the same degree of any of this stuff, and you may not experience any... any um, emotional problems or you know what I mean it doesn't always mean that just because somebody's been abused that their whole life would just be ruined and and that their whole life would be a mess it it depends on severity depends on how long it ha- it, it went on for depends on whether there was anybody in a person's life who was supportive uh, especially a child like if there was somebody in the in the family somewhere that was supportive to that child and trying to help them out through the abuse you know um it, you know if if the abuse continued only for a really short time you know Somebody might have, you know, might not develop some of this stuff. But the thing is, is we all know how harsh it is and how painful it is for children. You know what I mean? And the damage that that does occur because of it, and especially if it goes on and on, and and if it's severe enough, you know what I mean? It can cause some serious problems. And I I recognize a lot of this stuff in in my own family as well as myself. Some of it, of course, I don't I don't diagnose myself. So like I never self diagnose myself. So I have no clue. I've never been diagnosed with PTSD or you know uh, anxiety issues because I've never been diagnosed. Period. You know what I mean? Because I never went for help. And any time I went into the hospital, it was all for for you know physical stuff like car accidents and things like this, right? And even you know I had to have surgery one time on my face because I had cancer on my face and things like this and you know they did ask me questions about my past and I would, would never ever tell anybody like a doctor that I had been abused right the only time that any doctor ever recognized that I had been abused as a child was when I went into the hospital with my car accident at the age of 18 and they were running x-rays of my head and my neck and stuff they would actually did a full body scan and they were like where what what happened to you <laughs> you know <laughs> because they were like there's just some serious issues here and uh they did talk to me about it and i did tell them the truth and so they're the only people that actually mentioned anything to any you know um and i was 18 years old and they were just like well you know um it was a little bit they had to be helping out somebody who's 18 years old they did say that they did recognize it and they could see it and they said we you know this is just not good i said i know well you telling me, and so they did talk to my parents, and they said, you know, you should have treated her a bit better. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I mean, other than that, no doctors like we were not taken to doctors as children. It didn't matter how severe you know the abuse was, we had to just deal with it. You know, and my parents did not want us to go to the doctor because they had already been busted for child abuse, so we were never taken to the doctor, never ever. We went for our shots. You know, like almost feel like a dog or cat, you know, going for your shots, right? We went for our childhood disease shots, right? And that was it. I'm telling you, we never went to see the doctor if we were sick. We never even had a checkup. I never had a doctor after I was born and never even had a, an opportunity to see a doctor. And so, you know, because my our, my parents were brought up on charges, on abuse charges. So there's no way that they wanted any of their children to be seeing any kind of doctor, right? So, you know, the buggers abused us all, right? So it wasn't just me. And so, you know, I just kept that to myself, you know. So I've never been diagnosed with anything. We were supposed to get counseling as a, as a family when they got busted. They were told to get family counseling. They were also told to get marital counseling. And then they were also told by the courts, by the judge, 
that they had to get their own counseling because they were both abused themselves. They were both so screwed up from the abuse, right? I mean, if, and from other things. I think my dad, um, my, my dad's side of the family definitely has mental problems, and even his siblings, and not just him. He is his whole family on his side, aunts and uncles, his, like his sisters and brothers, and my dad's family. They're all something wrong with them, you know what I mean? Because they're all a little bit messed up um, in the head, right? And they all have had to have brain tumors removed, and um, you know, issues like this, and they've all they all have some type of issues. I don't know what exactly what the deal is, but they, my grandparents were first cousins, which if that gives you any idea, um, they might have been, their parents might have been first cousins. So it might be sort of you know that whole thing where you shouldn't be marrying too much in you know your own family, right? Because it causes problems. My dad's parents were first cousins, right? And who knows, maybe their parents were first cousins too and it just really screwed everything up, right? And not only that, but they had all kinds of bizarre behaviors. They were born in the late 1800s. Their parents were born in the in the 1850s. So there's only, between me and my great-grandparents, there's only two generations, right? So, I mean, I come from people who were born in 1850, really. Um, and so there was no, you know, no chance for multi-generational, like, to, to correct some of this stuff, right? So, you know, it's, yeah, it's hard to say what was going on with them guys, but I, I just think there, there's some serious issues. Cause my dad was diagnosed borderline schizophrenic as well as borderline personality disorder and uh, manic depressive. My mom was diagnosed manic depressive as well. But nobody talked too much about the fact that my dad was diagnosed manic depressive as well, but he is and he was. But mostly people were concerned with the fact that he was schizophrenic because he was always talking about killing himself and killing us and he was always having these hallucinations and this psychosis where he would go into these psychosis and for days, you know, and he would stay there. It's not like he went in for psychosis for, you know, a couple of minutes and then that was it. I mean, he would when he was going into psychosis, you know, it's it was a little dangerous around there for until he came out of it. So we all thought, you know, well, he's just mentally ill. There's just he's something seriously wrong with him. We didn't really realize that he was depressed as well. You know what I mean? He had so many issues. He had so many problems. So those counselors, you know, they told him to get help for their own personal issues. And they we should have never, not the counselors, but the court. The the courts told my parents to get help. So my parents went to two counseling sessions. This is what the older siblings actually told me. And they remember going. They remember going to two family counseling sessions, and that was it. Then my parents just skirted around it and got away with it, and then we moved out of the country, and that was it. You know, they didn't want to get any help for their issues, right? So we were brought up like that, so we didn't want to get any help for our issues. You know, it's like my parents taught us to to not trust people, right? It's like, oh, you can't trust doctors. You can't trust... um, you can't trust therapists and counselors. They'll just take your information and they'll hurt you, right? That that was how we were brought up. We were told that if we told anybody, we would just they would just use the information and they would just hurt us because we we were just manipulated and warped by our parents, right? I mean, our parents, thought, you know, because they had already been busted and put up on charges of child abuse, they were so paranoid after that, right? They didn't they didn't stop abusing us and they didn't stop abusing each other, but they would be thinking that you know, oh, the government's going to come and take everything right well the government did come and take all of our stuff because our parents went bankrupt um you know a few years later after they had been brought up on abuse charges they went bankrupt about what three four years later and i remember being about well i was six years old and my parents lost everything i mean they they took they came and they took everything like we're talking furniture um and we didn't have much you know we were in a house with five kids two parents seven people living in a tiny little house and so you know they just took it all. So our parents were always like talking about, oh, the government. So I grew up hearing this stuff and actually believed it, that people were out to get us and that, you know, the government was out to get us. And so were all the, the, the therapists and the counselors. And, you know, we were we were told that if we ever told anybody what went on in the home, we'd be killed. I mean, my mom used to threaten my life quite often saying stuff like that. And, um, you know, so when you grow up around that kind of insanity, <laughs> it's bound to have an effect on you. You know what I mean? So I look at this stuff and I think, wow, I mean, I very well may have some of these disorders and I I very well may have. I know that I have issues, you know, and and I've had, you know, problems with like, you know, flashbacks and stuff from the abuse and whatnot. I think that's probably somewhat normal for people who have been abused and beaten and battered, right, and and, uh, verbally, you know, assaulted, right. And but I don't know if I have DID and stuff like that, right? I mean, I'd have to be diagnosed. So I never self-diagnosed myself, right? But my parents were diagnosed, both of them, with mental illness and mental problems, right? And emotionally unstable, right? So harsh situation. 
for anybody, you know what I mean? And so we have to get help, you know, like me. You know, at some point, I probably will go get some help, you know what I mean? Like, I'll probably go and talk to a counselor. I've talked to a few, and they actually said, well, if you can if you can ask yourself that question and tell yourself that question, you're probably fine. It's the people that always say, well, I don't need a counselor, I don't need a therapist. In the meantime, their their behavior is way out of line, you know what I mean? Those people are, are pretty much the ones that need to go see somebody because they're having issues. Anybody who can work through their stuff and come out of it on the other end a lot better off and a lot healthier, you know, and, and feeling a lot better and not spinning off out of control um, is doing pretty good, you know what I mean? So, But I still think, you know, there's a couple of issues that I kind of want to go talk to a counselor about, and that was the sexual abuse that I suffered as a child. I really want to get kind of to the bottom of it. I'd like to release it and let it go. And because I can't, because I blocked it, I blocked a lot of it. I only remember certain parts of it. So I'd like to get in touch with it so that I can let it go, you know what I mean? Because right now it bothers me that I can't see it because I, I blocked it out as a kid. And somebody actually told me, a good friend actually told me, uh, who's worked with survivors of child abuse, child sexual abuse, um, told me that um, maybe I had I had really didn't see it because maybe I, my my face was covered. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, she said, "Well, maybe you didn't really block it. Maybe you, your face was covered with a a pillow or a blanket or something." And I was like, "Oh, well, okay. Well, maybe that makes sense." But um, I still would, you know, I may go see a counselor or therapist for that. But we just have to get help, you know, if we're suffering along because of the abuse we've suffered and we're not doing well and we deserve to get we deserve to have a better life right i mean my god does anybody deserve this crap what this woman here Catherine patricelli was talking about you know the stuff that happens to people because they've that could happen to people because they've been abused i mean it's absolutely ridiculous i know so many survivors who have problems with so many problems with ptsd with um um fibromyalgia even physical symptoms that have come about because of the abuse, right? I mean, not just not just mental or emotional pain. It's it's a lot of times physical pain, right? Because of the abuse they suffered. And I know myself. I'm dealing with physical pain every day, and I know exactly where it comes from. You know what I mean? From from the beatings that I took. So I know exactly where you know because of where the the pain is. You know that that, that where that came from. So it's a daily reminder for me that my parents beat the shit out of me. <laughs> And that, you know, I mean, I, what am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? Just take drugs all the time? Well, I did that until I was 21 years old to block the pain. You know what I mean? So I don't want to be, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be using drugs, right? So I did drugs until I was 21 and I got off of them. So it's like, well, you know, people say, well, you could take other pills, you know, pain pills and stuff like that. And it's like, I don't want to be on pain pills. You know what I mean? But it's it's just kind of, it's one of those things that... It's harsh for people, you know, when you have these body memories, you have these memories in your mind and you have and dealing with the aftermath of abuse, right? Do we ever did we deserve it? No, we didn't. No one does and you know, it's harsh on people. Like uh, I look at this stuff and I think, My God, this really relates to my family, you know. Like she said here that you know, she's talking, she says severe abuse can lead the victim to contemplate suicide or carry out suicidal impulses and that's just very true because my brother killed himself, and he tried many times. It's not like he he tried once and made it. I mean, the guy wanted out, <laughs> and at the age of thirty three, he finally made it. You know, he had been trying to kill himself for over a period of thirteen years, and um, you know, he finally made it. And uh, I wasn't surprised when we got the call. And my other brother killed himself really because he knew that the drugs would kill him. He used to take bags of pills, and he would overdose and. They'd save him. Or he, he'd just get saved all the time. And um, finally, he died in a shelter here in Calgary at the age of 43. And so, you know, it's very sad, right? My dad was always trying to kill himself. Um, he was quite often running, like he would run down the freeway naked in the middle of the night, um, trying to kill himself, getting hit by, he'd get, trying to get hit by a car and stuff. And so my brothers would have to go and save him and get him and drag him back to the house and lock him in his bedroom, like, didn't have any locks on the doors, but they'd have to bar him in his bedroom so that he wouldn't get out and kill himself, right? So my dad was really actually very much suicidal. My mom was um, always talking about suicide, right? And quite often talking about killing herself or somebody else, which would have been me. My mom was always quite often talking about killing me and um, and herself sometimes, right? But yeah, when you grow up around suicidal people, you know, and it seems like it's an option. It's kind of, you know, it's like, it's horrible what people, what this does to people. And so, you know, for me, suicide was an option until I was 40, about 41 years old. 
And I never went through with it, thank God, because I'm here sitting on the other side of this now thinking, thank God I did not do that. Because my brother did not, my two brothers didn't get a chance to um, to heal. They never got a chance to know what it's like to um, feel good about themselves uh, because they were abused horrifically, you know what I mean, Like just like myself. And they, you know, they never knew a day of peace in their life, right? Whereas I was able to take a look at this whole thing and I've just been, you know, whether you want to call it lucky or blessed or whatever, you know, to actually learn to love myself and learn that I did not deserve that abuse and my dysfunctional family can just toddle off. I really don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like my, my immediate family I'm talking about. You know what I mean? My the two, the two siblings I have left in my life who have completely shut me out and my dad who's trying to guilt trip me into staying into some sort of relationship, you know, because my dad's still living. And they both, they all know I wrote the book. They're all not happy about it. Um, it's not much they can do about it. Too bad. I'm going, I went public with my, with our story. So it's uh, too bad. I don't care if they liked it or not. I, so I didn't like being abused and I didn't like their attitude about me either. My, my siblings were abusive towards me too and they still are. So it's like, you know, you think you're going to treat me like that at the age of 41, you can forget it or the, at the age of, of 40. Eight or whatever, you know what I mean? It's incredibly wrong, and um, they'll never see me any differently because they were so they were abused too, right? So I'm dealing with a whole group of people who were so screwed up in the head that how are you ever going to have like how would I ever have a healthy relationship with my family? Because I just can't, and the reason being is that they will not get help. They will not take a look at this for what it really is. And then you know, on their own healing journey, get themselves some help and realize that they're just still stuck in the same dysfunctional behaviors that they were doing years ago and so it's like hey if you guys want to do that whatever but i'm not in on it anymore i'm not playing that role i'm not playing that same role that was given to me as a child and, and handed out to me by my siblings like i refuse to play that role anymore so basically they know pretty much that our relationship is over because they're not going to come to me and say look we understand you know what you're talking about and like we're really sorry and it never should have happened um, and we're going to all try to treat each other a lot better. You know, we're going to try to um, acknowledge what you're doing and acknowledge what, what we're doing and acknowledge what happened to this family and sit down and heal from it together. But they don't want to do that, you know what I mean? So my brother hasn't talked to me, what, for five years, you know, um, hates me and hates what I'm doing, you know. It's like, well, whatever, I don't care. And uh, my other sister is, my, the only other sibling that was left is uh, out of seven is... Um, in denial. So she's just pretending that I haven't even written that book. <laughs> she's still pretending that my brother hasn't killed himself too, right? She she has she's pretending that nothing ever happened, right? She's she's very good at denial, right? She's a she's a pro, right? Pro denial. Um she refuses to even admit that my brother killed himself, right? And I mean, she went to his funeral, so it's not like she doesn't know that he killed himself. She just doesn't want to admit that he hung himself. And um, she, she knows that he hung himself, right? But she she doesn't want to admit it because that would mean she'd have to face it, right? So she just goes along in life blindly, you know, whatever. Hey, whatever she has to do, right? I mean, that's totally cool. But the thing is, is they don't support me on my thing, and they still want me to play that same uh, role of being the uh, outcast because I was the only one in the family that that my mom wanted to throw out of the home. So, you know, when I was like 12 years old, 13 years old, my mom was like always talking about kicking me out, right? And I was the only one. And, of course, everybody else, um, you know, they were doing prison time. They were doing drugs. They were, you know, um, threatening to kill each other with knives. My brother would, like, one time actually held a knife to my sister's throat for a couple hours and threatened to kill her if if she wouldn't give him a ride somewhere and you know it's it's, it's I talked about that on another blog talk show here not too long ago but this is the thing the, the behavior was crazy in my home you know and then my my mom wanted to throw me out and I was like you got to be kidding me you know what I mean like look at what's going on around here and what all the other siblings are doing prison time and everything else and plus hurting each other and you want to throw me out and I'm and I'm actually trying to behave myself in graduating high school and everything. Like I'm, I I mean I was at the age of twelve, thirteen. I was pla I was going to school. I was not ditching school. I was doing drugs, right? But all everybody in my home was pretty much doing drugs. But the thing is, is you know I was on I was acting pretty good. My behavior was pretty good compared to some of the other siblings. And yet my mom would want to throw me out. She she just wanted to hurt me. She she I was like her punching bag. She she would make her feel better. Like if she could if she could hurt me, right? So that's the whole issue. I, I just came along at the right time for her to use as, as as a punching bag, right? But my siblings kind of still want me to play that role so that they can continue to treat me however they want 
without me saying anything. And you, because whenever I say anything, they scream at me. My especially my sister, you know, gets real, um, um, you know, screaming at me like my mom used to scream at me. And I'm like, don't talk to me that way. You know what I mean? We're in our forties now, and you're 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 fifty, and I refuse to take that. You know. So this is the thing. I've had to put my foot down because I've you know no longer play this role out, and so you know I refuse to to um, play that old role that was given to me as as a, a child, right? And they still think that I should roll over and take it, whatever they want to dish out. And I'm like, I don't think so. Not anymore. I put my foot down. I, You know, they, they have no respect for me or what I'm doing. And, um, you know, will I ever be able to gain their respect or to gain their, um, you know, approval? Uh, probably not. You know what I mean? They'll never see what I'm doing as, as a good thing, even though I'm healing and I'm not thinking about killing myself anymore and I'm not on drugs and I'm have a really pretty decent life. You know what I mean? Um, are they going to ever respect that? Probably not. You know what I mean? And they don't care that I'm the the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. They don't care that I'm the, you know, helping to stop child abuse. You know what I mean? They, they don't care that I'm uh, out public speaking and, and trying to stop child abuse and helping people and getting help at myself. Because as I help people, it gives me, it helps me, right? Um, no, they don't care about that. Because, you know, they, you know, they just think child abuse is okay. Right? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous for people to sit there and say it's okay to abuse a child. You know, like my brother was an, uh, abusive to his son, and um, you know, so he he thinks child abuse. Well, what's you know, it's great, right? Treat your kids however you want. Hit them with a hammer or whatever you want, you know, which is what he did. <clears throat> Beat up my nephew with a hammer, right? And um, my nephew told me about this, and and his mother backed it. But the thing is, I mean, this is my bro. You know what I mean? And he thinks that abuse is fine. So how am I ever going to be able to relate with him, right? How could I? Because I totally don't agree, right? I mean, I, I think child abuse is sick and sad and wrong. And, <clears throat> you know, what we went through and what I went through never should have happened. The court should have removed us from the home. You know, there was five kids in the home at the time, two two children who were already, well, one was 16 and one was was Actually, one was 16 going on 17. The other one was 18 and married. Those two were out of the house, the oldest, right? And they had already spent a whole lifetime being abused by these two people. So they were gone. <laughs> um, the other five siblings in the home never should have been allowed to stay in the home because uh, the courts didn't deem it that it was threatening to our lives. And that's why they let my mom go ahead and, you know, my mom pleaded with the courts, and you know, let us keep our children. It's all we have. That's all I have. You know, it was all the dad blaming it on my dad, right? It's all my, all my husband's fault. He was abusing the kids because he was. He actually got busted because he he beat up my brother, and that's how he got busted for child abuse. And my mom was busted too because they said no. The siblings actually said no. It's not just our dad. Our moms even, were afraid of our mom too, right? <laughs> because our, our mom was vicious, right? I mean, uh, vicious woman who could kill you in an instant, right? She was very vicious, and uh, she weighed like almost 300 pounds, and she could kick you into the next week. You know what I mean? Um, she did some serious physical damage to my body, and she did some serious emotional and psychological damage to my mind. And so did my dad. You know, they were both horrific. Uh, and, you know, here's my bro thinking, oh, child abuse, what's wrong with that? I beat on my own son. It's like, you're sick and twisted. Now, had I known that, I would have actually reported it. But sadly enough, I was down in the States, and he was in Canada, and I didn't realize what was going on, or I would have actually made the call, but uh, and he would have been busted. So, you know, abuse, it's absolutely incredibly wrong, and it runs in families. So my family wants to continue being like this, and I'm like, you know what, I'm not playing this game anymore, so bye-bye. And I basically have shut them out of my life, you know, and um, it's a sad thing, but you know what, we were never, ever functional anyway. We were functional in our dysfunction, you know what I mean? We were We were just going along with it, you know, going along with the dysfunctional behaviors and just you know, for the longest time until, you know, about four years ago when I decided that I would heal instead of kill myself. And um, so now I can't be part of their dysfunction anymore, you know what I mean? So it doesn't work for me anymore because I'm wearing a new, uh, I got a new life script, right? And I really like this life script better because I finally feel like staying alive for the first time in my lifetime, right? So who, who's going to win out on this one, you know? Well, for sure I know it's going to be this healing journey, not my dysfunctional family, you know what I mean, Who who still thinks that, abuse is okay. It's like, give me a break. You know what I mean? So it's absolutely nuts. Make sure you do get some help and reach out. You know, if you don't have somebody to talk to, i got about a minute left here. If you don't have somebody to talk to, you know, make sure you you call a crisis line if you have to. You call somebody, right? Do not allow yourself to, to, to 
to go down because of this. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, my God, we certainly deserve so much better. And that's what I realized four years ago, sitting on the couch ready to self-injure and wanting to kill myself. And I thought, what am I doing? If I do this, I'm going to let my, my parents will win this fight because my parents already won the fight because my two brothers killed themselves. And I thought, no way they're not winning this fight. This is what they wanted. They wanted me to die. They actually tried, they tried to kill me, those buggers. You know what I mean? And so I'm like, why would I want to do this to myself? They just trained me how to kill myself. Those stupid, you know, I'm not even going to say it on the air. So what I'm saying to you is do not allow your abusers to win this fight. You know, that's not right. They don't deserve to win the fight. We do. We deserve to win and have a good life and go on and heal and get and, and get better. Whatever way that is, whether you know, you wanna see a, a counselor or a therapist or or you know, whatever you gotta do. Um do not ever give up. My that's my thing, right? Um I just I can't say it enough, right? We just don't ever give up. My brothers gave up. I was ready to give up so many times and I just want people to know, you know, just to to hang in there and and uh, not ever ever give up. Give it a chance for another day. And every time, every time, every day, give it another chance for another day for a better day. Cuz there's not always better days. Sometimes it's really crappy. You know what I mean? And sometimes it's really dark and sometimes it's not it's not fun. You know, it's miserable and it's misery. You know what I mean? And it's like being in hell. I've been there, I know. But if you wait and you give it enough time, you know what I mean, and you reach out every day and you reach out a little bit more, you know, it, it can change. And so that's, I just want to be here to say, look, it can change because I'm proof, you know. And and I know so many people who have been in the same situation who were, you know, had th- had attempted suicide and who were ready to just give it all up, you know, and they're still here and they're like, no, we got to fight this. And they're, so now they're helping me because they've been on their healing journey for a long time and they're they're reaching out to me saying, you can do this. You know, so that's my thing. Make sure you reach out and you talk to somebody if you need somebody to talk to. If you can't get a hold of me or any or somebody that you know personally, then you you call a crisis line, right? Do whatever you have to do, but you make sure that you stick around with us, okay? So we'll talk to you all tomorrow. Well, actually, I'll be on tonight. My shows, both my shows, uh, my own personal show, and also Dreamcatchers Talk Radio with Elizabeth. Raleigh. We've got a great show lined up for tonight talking about uh, children with mentally ill parents and how, how to help children who have a mentally ill parent and how to how to explain to them, you know, um, the situation to help them to to be able to cope with it, right? So we're going to talk about that. And so it's going to be a great show, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Dreamcatchers. So I hope you can check that out. And then I'll be back on my show tonight, too, right after that. So Have a great day, everybody. Take really good care of yourself. Thanks for being here and tuning into my show. We'll talk to you real soon. Bye-bye.